Thank you all for coming out on a Wednesday evening to spend some time with us, hearing some stories. Uh, this event is focused on amplifying the stories of first generation and second generation immigrants in our city. My name is Diana Medina. I'll be your host for the evening. Uh, I am a uh, storyteller. I'm an educator. I'm a poet. And I also uh, work with Capital Storytelling, uh, coaching storytellers and uh, leading different workshops and things like that. So we we love stories. Uh, I, I believe this is a very deeply ancestral practice that we do. Um, all of us are fluent in stories. Before there was social media or anything like that, there was stories. So we are all engaging in something very, very sacred this evening. So thank you all for that. Um, and before we kick off the full uh, scope of the event, I wanted to invite Jenny up to do our land acknowledgement. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny. I'm the graduate assistant at the Dreamer Resource Center here at Sac State. This is our land acknowledgement. Sacramento State acknowledges with respect the land our campus is on today was and continues to be. The homelands of the indigenous people of this area. The Nisanon, specifically the Nisan Pawanon, the Miwok, the larger Sacramento area and its rivers serve as a gathering place for many local tribes from the surrounding valleys and foothills, including the Southern Maidu, Hootwin, and Wintun. Sacramento State recognizes these lands and riverways as unceded traditional territories of the native peoples. We further recognize these California native nations and respect their sovereignty. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm the university's commitment to build relationships and foster a university environment of success to better serve Native nations and communities. That was beautiful. I just want to respond to that by saying, and so it is. Yes. So it is. Uh, and speaking of partnerships, uh, this event is uh, done in partnership with uh, Capital Storytelling and the uh, Dreamer Resource Center here at Sacramento State. So I'm going to uh, have Kim come up and share a few words about the Dreamer Resource Center. Hello everyone, hola. Uh, welcome to Immigrant Stories. My name is Kimberly Gomez and I'm the program coordinator of the Dreamer Resource Center here at Sacramento State. Um, we have collaborated with Capital Storytelling for the past three academic years. Capital Storytelling has provided immigrant storytelling workshops to over 60 undocumented students here at Sac State. And this is our third annual Immigrant Stories Together. The first year we had about 110 people, and today we're able to fill up the room with 200. So, it's been great. At the Dreamer Resource Center, our mission is to make the dream of a college degree a reality for undocumented students and students from mixed status families. And we assist them with programming, services, and resources to make sure that they can achieve their academic and personal goals. Uh, so you were all handed a fundraising flyer. It's a little squared flyer. If you didn't, uh, when you're heading out or during intermission, you can grab one. Um, every year at Immigrant Stories, we like to promote our um, emergency grant. So our emergency grant supports undocumented students who are experiencing financial hardships. Um, anyone that has DACA, the average age is about 25 years old. A lot of the students at Sac State are not 25 years old. And so students right now are not protected from deportation. They don't have work permits. They don't have social security numbers. So a lot of our students are experiencing financial hardships. And so the fundraising flyers are for you to keep, to share, to donate. And 100% of your donations will be given to our students. I also want to acknowledge that yesterday, October 28th, 
was National Immigrants Day. So that's a big deal. And we would have had immigrant stories yesterday, but this room was booked. So <laughs> it's today. Um, next year, I will book the room like way in advance so we can have it on October 28th. <laughs> uh, but immigrant stories, uh, we're doing immigrant stories to honor immigrants on National Immigrants Day. And with that, I want to do just a short piece. Uh, my familia immigrated here from Mexico 33 years ago, and in another life, I would be my mom's mom, so I could love her the way that she loves me. And in another life, I would take my stepdad to the steps of Rome. And in another life, I would tear down the walls so my dad can see his mom for the first time for being a breast cancer survivor. But in this life, I'm trying my best. And so I hope that you all enjoy Immigrant Stories. Ooh, another round of applause for that beautiful piece. Thank you. I uh, love it when people bring their full selves, their full stories, and their poetic words to our spaces. Um, I also want to share a little bit about Capital Storytelling. Uh, Capital Storytelling is a nonprofit organization uh, based here in Sacramento. Our goal is to empower people to build community together using the power of storytelling. Um, and I myself uh, discovered Capital Storytelling uh, during the pandemic when I was in need of community um, and looking for a place to connect with folks who also wanted community and quickly found myself welcome with open arms into the lovely storytelling spaces that Capital Storytelling creates for people all over the city from all walks of life. Stories are in everything. And uh, I'm so happy to be here with all of you, so happy that we're able to share some of these fun uh, stories that are coming up, and also uh, appreciate you all in advance for bearing with me as we celebrate and honor all of the different hands that it took to put an event like this together, because um, it, it does take some coordination, right? So uh, we were able to get a, a grant uh, that was given to the Dreamer Resource Center that's part of what funds this work um, and this event this evening. We've also got um, some friends from Capital Public Radio. Raise your hand if you're here from Capital Public Radio. Thank you, Capital Public Radio. Uh, specifically to Tashina Brito, who always supports our work. Um, and also, if you're from SMUD, raise your hand if you're from SMUD. Our friends from SMUD are here. Um, thank you for the sponsorship that helped fund this event um, and making sure that uh, you know it stays uh, available to as many people that can sit in this room. Um, I quickly want to bring up uh, the SMUD board president, Rosanna Herber, to share a few words. Hello, everybody. I, uh, I wore my sparkling shoes for you tonight. I'm Rosanna Herber, and I'm the SMUD board president. And we are thrilled to be sponsoring this event. When I saw it come up on the log of events, it's like, oh my gosh, I want to go to that one. Because I'm a storyteller at heart. I'm. Uh, actor, I've done theater, you know, <laughs> and I know what happens in these rooms. People connect with people, people understand each other more, and people open their hearts. As the SMUD board president, I want you to know that we exist to make all your lives better. We do. We keep your rates low. We, keep, we make sure your power is on, and we are going green. We are going to be zero carbon by 2030. We are cleaning up the air in this community, and we're the first utility in the nation to be taking on this task. So I'm very proud of that as your SMUD board president, and I want you to know if anyone has any SMUD issues, I'm here to help you. <laughs> I mean it, you know, we've got all kinds of programs. So, you know, as, as, as time moves on, 
you know, we're going to have a big important day coming next week. And all I want to say is, Let's show each other love and understanding, and let's build some of that tonight. So thank you for letting us be a part of this. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I hope you all take Rosanna up on her offer <laughs> to share. I would also say share your smut stories, because maybe there's some good ones. That's right. All right. Uh, last uh, last uh, group of folks I want to acknowledge is that uh, we also have uh, Sacramento PBS. KVIE is in the room. Round of applause for Sacramento PBS. Amazing. Um, I want to make us all aware they are here covering the event this evening and they are filming. So if for some reason you do not want to be filmed or you do not want to appear, please contact Shelly. Shelly, are you in the room and can you raise your hand? There you go. Please uh, find Shelly, and she will make sure that uh, you you are not in the things that they share. Got it? All right. Um, amazing. So to give you a rundown of the evening, uh, we are going to have five storytellers share uh, amazing stories. And um, I will be reading a little bio and uh, you know background about each one of them as I introduce them. Um, after the first three, we'll do a short intermission and I may be sprinkling in some announcements and or uh, micro stories in between each person just to help us keep the show running quite nicely. Um, so I'll start with the first little micro story, which is I'm a, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, I am the uh, second. Uh, born in the United States, youngest of eight. So uh, both of all of my siblings immigrated here, except for me and my older sister, who were the last two of the family. Um, and two things we were regularly reminded of was how much everybody sacrificed so that we could have American freedom <laughs> all our childhood. Uh, the other thing we were very much quickly reminded of is that uh, when there's a giant age gap between you and your oldest siblings and they start having babies, uh, caregiving is a collective responsibility. <laughs> so you quickly get promoted from nine-year-old baby of the family to auntie and co-parent and toddler wrangler. So I have lots of experience with people's little ones as a result. Um, and another fun thing I like to share about my family, which helps me hold on to my ancestry uh, is my dad, uh, who used to say, I don't care if we live in California, de la puerta para adentro, aquí es México. From the door on in, this is Mexico. Um, so I never forgot that, and it always made me stay connected to my Mexican roots. Uh, especially in Los Angeles, that's very nice, because you know most of California used to be Mexico, historically speaking anyway. So with that being said, uh, I want to bring up our first storyteller of the evening, uh, Lucy McCullough. Um, Lucy is Mexican born uh, with Nicaraguan roots, raised in Canada and immigrated to the US in 2004. Her unique upbringing led her to love all things pop culture and that love of pop culture helped spark and shape her interest in story structure and storytelling. She attended her first storytelling classes with Capital Storytelling in summer of 2019 with the hopes of using her skills at the classes she learned in everyday life. She officially joined the Sacramento Storytelling, uh, or Capital Storytelling staff, excuse me, that's what I get for reading, uh, in 2023, uh, where she now brings her experience in photography, videography, and social media to help us grow our audience and reach. Welcome, Lucy, and Lucy's story, the polar bear situation. Yes, please. Okay. There? Yeah, that's good. good. Okay. Okay. I'm a little bit nervous. You've got this. It's all right. She's got this. <laughs> okay. So to know about me, you really need to know where I come from. So I have both Mexican and Canadian citizenship, and I've been living in the U.S. with my husband and my daughter for the last 20 years. I was born to Nicaraguan parents who were college students in Mexico when I was born. All right, so now here's where the story starts. We're going to go back to the 1900s, back to 1987 when I was six years old, and my parents came up to me and they said that they had something super important to tell me. So we were going to go to Mexico City. 
and I loved going to Mexico City. So I was so excited. I knew I'd get to see my great aunt and her daughter, and they said that they had some business to take care of while we were there. So I'm all excited. I didn't know what was actually going on. At the time, what I didn't realize is that my parents' student visas had expired, and they were clamoring for ways to stay in Mexico. But when they, like, when they were out of possibilities, you know, they had to find a new place to go to. And going back to Nicaragua was just not an option at the time, just due to the political situation in Nicaragua. And for like a variety of other reasons, that would be a whole story in and of itself. So we get on the bus, and I didn't realize at the time that that bus would be like the beginning of a whole chain of events that would change my whole life. All right, so once we get to Mexico City, you know, we see my great aunt and I see her daughter and we get to the business. And the business that we had to go to was boring, okay? <laughs> so boring. We had to go from embassy to embassy, trying to find somebody that would let us immigrate to their country. And so for six-year-old me sitting in a waiting room, having to be quiet and like not fidget and like not be loud, um, that was torture until we got to the Canadian embassy. Now at the Canadian embassy, they let us go wait in a library. They had this library, so as soon as you walk in, you get that smell of books that, you know, you know that smell, and some of us are just like into that smell. Um, <laughs> and so we get, the, we get in there, and already I'm excited because there's books, but there was a children's section. So I go in and I check out the books, and I find some Inuit stories, you know, with Inuit illustrations, and they had illustrations of like polar bears and caribou and like igloos. And then I find some other, some other books and they had like children in Canada playing in the different seasons. And in the books with the kids playing, there were like a lot of different kinds of kids, but the kids that really stood out to me and like were primarily focused like in the book were white kids who were blonde hair and blue eyed. So what does six-year-old me do? Okay, what is Canada? Well, everybody at the embassy is white. So like, okay, white people, blonde hair, blue eyed, Canadians. Okay, what else? Well, the books had igloos. So obviously, Canadians live in igloos. <laughs> and there were polar bears, so I'm sure like polar bears are just hanging out. Um, so here we go. Blonde hair, blue eyed, igloos, polar bears, right? And you know, we go back to Monterrey and, you know, we get, we hear back and the Canadian embassy says, okay, you can come, we'll, you know, we'll help you immigrate. This is fantastic. My parents tell me that we're moving to Toronto and I was so excited. I was excited for the adventure, like in a new country, like let's go, but I was a little bit stressed. And what had me stressed? I mean, what was the igloo situation? <laughs> like, <laughs> Are they ready-made or do you make it yourself? What is the heating thing? Like, I mean, I know there's snow in Canada, but like how bad is the snow? Uh, like six-year-old me was like stressed, but I was excited for this new adventure and I was ready to go. So we get on the plane, you know, and we're on our way, you know, I'm just balancing with excitement. We're just like, we're going to Canada. I'm going to be Canadian, like, and, like, I just was like one step closer to my Canadian Barbie dreams, okay? So we land in Canada and I tell my mom, mom, I really have to go to the bathroom. And she's like, okay, oh, hey, Lucy, we have to wait. Like, we have to go through immigration and get our baggage. She's like, no, please, I need to go to the bathroom right now. Okay, so she takes me to the bathroom and I run in. And I go and I look in the mirror and I have a complete meltdown. And why was I crying? Um, I was not blonde hair and blue eyed. Uh, when I landed, I thought that Canadians were blonde hair and blue eyed. And I was distraught that I did not look like the Barbies. Like I wanted to be the blonde hair and blue eyed. Finally, my mom gets me calmed down. She explains to me that's not how it works. And I was like, okay, but like not okay, you know? Um, and so we go through immigration and we get our luggage and we meet our social worker. And the social worker's job was to get us settled in Canada and help us navigate this new country. And so she takes us out and like, it's August and I'm noticing that it's kind of warm. I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe it's just heat. Like, cause it's cold in Canada. So like maybe they put heat out. Um, 
And then she, and I thought we were gonna go like on public transit because in Mexico we didn't have a car. So like I was very accustomed to public transit and out comes a limo and she had us in a limo, you guys. Okay, so I was like, what happens? Like in Canada, I don't have to take a bus anymore. No subways. You mean I get to ride in a limousine? Canada is amazing. I love it here. Little did I know it was just something special that she had worked out for her clients to help move them to their new homes. And so we get to this new apartment and, you know, she helps get us all settled in. And I'm looking around and the apartment is fully furnished. And I was like, holy smokes, you guys. Apartments in Canada are fully furnished. How freaking cool. And I'm running around and looking and I had my own room. I'd never had a, my own room before. I'd always had to share with my parents. And like the room had like, you know, some kitty decor. I mean, it wasn't to my taste, but it was still cool <laughs> kitty decor. So I was so excited. I know I was running around while my parents are sitting there. It was my dad's birthday the day that we moved. And they're stressing because, you know, they came with very little to their name. Um, it would actually shock you when I, if I tell you how like little we had with us. And, you know, we had no guarantee of success in Canada. Okay. So, you know, I'm having a great time and they're stressed. And then the next day, um, the social worker had told us like how to navigate the TTC, which is the Toronto Transit. Um, and so we get on a bus and I'm listening to all the people talking, trying to like pick up words. My parents told me we're going to something called a food bank. I'd never been to a food bank before. What, do you, what is that? Um, but we get there and it's a big building that kind of looked like a church. And we go into this dark room and there's some man at the front, like droning on and preaching. And that was so oh, boring. Again, six-year-old me is like, I don't want to have to listen to this. I don't understand this. Like, please, I don't want to listen to this. And then they call us and they hand us a box of food. What do you mean they just hand you a box of food? In Mexico, we went to the market or the supermarket to buy our food. What do you mean in Canada, they just hand you food? Canada is amazing. I love Canada. Oh, they just give you a box of food in Canada. Like, uh, you know, I can deal with all these other like things because, you know, you get a box of food. And so then we get back home. And that night, my uncle who had been living in Toronto for a little while, he comes to visit. And this is my first time meeting him. And I loved getting to meet him. It was so exciting to have family nearby. And so, you know, the adults get to talking and I pull out my Barbies, which were one of the few toys that I was allowed to bring. And so I'm playing with my Barbies and like the adults are talking and my uncle stops me and he's like, what are you doing? What are you saying? And I was like, well, the Barbies are in Canada. They're Canadian. They're speaking English. Like how clear, how much clearer could it be? Um, and so they, he's like, no, no, but what did you call them? Okay. And like little ones cover your ears. <laughs> um, the, the, I proceed to tell him that this one was bitch and this one was because. And he's like, well, why did you name them them? Well, those are the things I heard on the bus and on the subway and I thought they were names. And I mean, I was shocked that that was not a name and nobody, like my parents didn't know to tell me that those were not appropriate Barbie names. Um, I was a little downhearted, you know, downtrodden, but it's okay. Like we got past it. We learned some real names. Um, and then about a week goes by and it's the day before school and my parents are sitting at the kitchen table and they're writing out a note with their Spanish to English dictionary. And the note says, you know, my name, hi, like my name is Lucy. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm six years old. This is my birthday. And like this, like this is my first day here. I don't know where I'm going. Please help me find my, like my classroom. And that note the next day would be stapled to my shirt the way it did back in Mexico. Whenever we had things that had to go back and forth, they stapled them to our shirts. So they stapled this note to my shirt. My mom, the next day, I'm so excited. I'm like, new school, new friends. I'm going to love it. And she takes us to the bus stop that the social worker took her, told her to take us to. And we get there. And my mom is asking, like, you know, St. Francis? Like, like, is this like, the right school? And she doesn't really know how to ask, but she's doing her best. And, um, you know, we get on the bus. And she had to just trust that 
I was going to get to the right place. And I think about it now as a parent myself, like I cannot imagine the anxiety and the nerves that she had to trust that like I was going on the right bus and that I would make it to where I needed to go. Um, and I actually talked to her about this last weekend and she told me that she chased that bus. Yeah. She chased that bus to try to make sure that I got to where I needed to go. Um, and again, I can't even blame her. I probably would have done the same thing. Um, but now I think about it like 37 years later um, and I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the sacrifices that they made for us. Um, you know, they, they you know, came to a new country. They were so brave to like uproot their lives again for a second time to start anew in a new country, in a new city, with a new culture, you know, and all just in the hopes of, you know, giving us all a better life. And, you know, and through it all, they allowed me to be a kid, even though they were dealing with so much stress and upheaval in their lives, they still allowed me to be a kid. And like, really, so I can still look at it now from the six-year-old perspective. And, you know, the stories you'll hear tonight are, you know, there are collective histories that allow us to really broaden our minds and our hearts and our perspectives and to really understand, you know, a little bit of what, you know, others go through as they're like leaving their homes, you know, in search of a new life. And then I'm going to leave you with one last thing. If you ever find yourself in Toronto, okay, do not worry. There are no igloos. <laughs> there are no polar bear. I mean, unless you go to the zoo, but that's a whole other issue. Okay, there's polar bear at the zoo. But what you really need to watch out for are the Canadian geese that will maul you <laughs> and the raccoons that are like scared of nobody. Thank you so much. Round of applause for Lucy. Uh, thank you for the notes on Toronto visiting. Uh, this see storytelling night is one part stories, one part trip advisors. <laughs> Plan your vacations, everybody. Amazing. Thank you. Um, all right, introducing our next storyteller now. We have Sarah uh, Aga Mohammadi. Uh, Sarah was born in Iran and immigrated to the United States with her family when she was two years old. As an Iranian-American, honoring her dual identities has both enriched her life with cultural depth and, at times, ambiguity. Her pursuits are as diverse as her background, a career in medicine, a hobby in improv comedy, and a hunger for travel and good food. She learned the art of storytelling through Capital Storytelling in 2020. Yay, fellow pandemic joiner of Capital Storytelling. <laughs> and has shared the benefits of this craft at work and at the Sacramento Comedy Spot. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Sarah and Sarah's story, Rite of Passage. <laughs> Short people profess. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. <sighs> Being bicultural feels like you belong to neither, and you're always longing to feel like you're one of them. But all it took was 20 terrifying minutes living the experience of an Iranian woman to finally feel like one of us. Ten years ago, my mom and I went to Iran to celebrate my cousin's wedding. And I should just warn you, I have a lot of relatives and a lot of cousins, so stay with me. <laughs> Towards the end of the trip, one of my younger cousins and I decided to go shopping so that I could get some souvenirs for myself and my, for my friends back home. I donned my most brightly colored, pretty hijab so I can keep up and blend in amongst the impeccably dressed Iranian women. And my cousin wore a pair of leggings that she had just gotten that had just come into fashion. We had the best day. We went shopping. We ate local Iranian bazaar food, like this really good blackberry juice and Iranian fusion pizza. And it was just the best, best time that we got to share. And as we're at the cafe um, and we're wrapping up the day, I wanted to hit up that blackberry juice stand one more time because I'm not kidding, it was really good. 
And so we gather up my, my bags, my shopping bags, and I notice that there's a woman standing by, sitting behind us. And she's wearing a traditional long black chador that goes down to the ground and is typically worn by pious religious women and you know, people in government. I didn't think anything of it. We gathered up my stuff and we went back out to the street. And as soon as we hit the street, my cousin tells me, walk faster, which I immediately complied. And no sooner had we hastened our step than we felt a tap on our shoulder. And it was the woman in black chador who had motioned for us to come with her. She was part of the uh, Iranian morality police. Now, I had heard about the Iranian morality police, but neither my cousin nor I had really had any experiences with them. You may have heard about Masa Amini two years ago, who was killed at the hands of the Iranian morality police. But up until this point, these were just stories that we had heard but not experienced. So naturally, we were very scared and nervous, but I looked to her for comfort because she kept it really cool. She was arguing with the guards, which I would not have had the nerves to do. And she was telling them to leave me alone because I wasn't from here. And of course that got their attention. Now they wanted to know where was I from? And she shot me this look that telepathically said, don't say anything, act dumb. Don't let them know you're American. American, that word has never sounded more foreign to me than in that moment. Here I was in a country where everyone kind of looked like me. They could say my name without skipping a beat. We shared the same body language and the same gestures that only another Persian would know without saying a word. But as soon as I open my mouth, it becomes very clear that I am not from here. I have one foot in two vastly different cultures that feel paradoxically familiar and foreign to me at the same time. Would I ever truly feel a sense of belonging to either? Or will I always feel othered because I belong to both and neither at the same time? Needless to say, I was scared. They took my cousin towards the van and she's frantically texting and trying to get in touch with her parents, friends, friends who had parents that were in positions of influence and deleting photos of, on her phone. Because you may not know that at the detention centers, they take your phone from you and they use any of the information that's in there, including your photos or texts or anything to use against you and to incriminate you. So she was frantically deleting any evidence. And I stood back at the advice of one of the guards who told me to get out of the way unless I wanted to be in the van with her. And I just watched everything unfold from about 10 feet away. And even though she was younger than me and all of this was happening to her, she still looked over at me from time to time and just gave me that Persian nod that everything would be okay. And I just watched. I watched as the guards rounded up more women, some of them also wearing brightly colored hijab, some wearing too much makeup, some clearly were showing their wealth, and all of them feisty, as only women living an oppressive regime could be. As they started to round up people and put them into the van, I, my cousin had been pushed towards the back. And I watched as the guard closed the door and went around the back into the driver's seat. And as he started the engine and started to pull away from the curb, I ran after this van. And the image of my cousin with her eyes full of fear and her hands pressed against the back rear view window haunts me to this day. Bordanish, they took her. Kojo Bordanish, where did they take her? I was screaming, I was hysterically screaming in the middle of the street. And people started to gather around me. And this young man pulled me out from the middle of the street and asked, what happened? Who of yours did they take? And I realized I had drawn attention to myself. I asked him to step back and, and don't be near me unless we're gonna be next. And he understood, he stepped back but stayed close by. And strangers started to circle around me, almost to create a protective shield to protect me from prying and suspicious eyes. A couple of them yelled back at the guards, cursing them for ruining their country and for trying to scare them into submission. A woman hugged me and another woman held my hand. And she told me that these things happen from time to time and that they just want bribes and that my cousin would come back to me 
soon enough. I, I was terrified. I had no idea what was happening. And they just, as a circle, they just kind of shifted me over to a storefront that was a couple feet away. And in true Persian hospitality and food as a love language, they told the store owner to serve me hot chai and cookies. And the man understood the assignment because he busted out the hot tea and the cookies and told me, eat, eat, you'll feel better. <laughs> he handed me a phone so that I could call someone. And I had a couple of numbers stored on my phone, but my hands were shaking I, and I couldn't figure out how to even dial an international number. So he took the phone from me and he dialed my aunt and my uncle and the few numbers that I had but couldn't get through because unbeknownst to us, my cousin was actually trying to get in touch with them at the same time. I gathered myself, I did drink the tea, um, I wiped my tears, I thanked everyone, and I desperately searched the crowd for any sign of my cousin. But everything was too loud, it was too bright, it was too busy, I was in sensory overload. But I stood there for what felt like hours but probably was no more than 20 minutes until I heard a voice. And off to the left, I see my cousin is running down the street, tears streaming down her face. And I run after her and we hug and we make sure that nothing has happened to either one of us. People around us are cheering and clapping and they're saying, we told you she'd be okay. <laughs> we're embarrassed, but we're just so grateful that we are back together. And we booked it out of that shopping area. And no sooner had we left than her mom pulls up and we jump into the back seat and she takes us home. We're again, we are met with hot tea and cookies and watermelon to calm our nerves. From my cousin's perspective, the detention center was no more than a couple blocks away. And what they typically do is they do take your phone away and it's meant to scare young women and men into you know, obeying the dress code and appropriate behavior. And they do this from time to time. And so she had to sign some BS form saying, I will oblige. And, uh, and she argued with them in a way that I never could imagine, where she then turned to the guard before she was released and said, if you touch one hair on my cousin's head, I will dig your grave. <laughs> I mean, damn, uh, <laughs> hell hath no fury like a woman against the establishment. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. You know, that night, I, I was hesitant to tell my mom the story because she wasn't with me at the time. And the moment I walked in the room, she read it on my face. She knew something was wrong. And so I told her, and she was glad that I was okay. And we talked about how we would tell this to my dad and my brothers back home. And we decided that we'd wait until we were here because it would just cause them to worry. And as we we're at this relative's house for a yet another gathering, one by one, my cousins started to share about their experiences with the morality police. And I realized that this was a trauma that was shared by so many Iranian women that fueled their anger at the government and also their compassion for another kindred soul who had experienced it. Unknowingly, I had undergone a rite of passage as an Iranian woman. My experience of the fear and intimidation that I felt by the Iranian morality police fundamentally contrasted with the warmth and compassion that I felt from the Iranian people. In a moment of pure fear and uncertainty, they wrapped me in a protective cloak of kinship and community and treated me as one of their own to protect. My fear was seen, my anguish was consoled, and my relief was celebrated by strangers on the street who just saw me as one of us. Because at the end of the day, people and their governments are not the same. Thank you. One more round of applause for Sarah. I just want to want to uplift the quotable quote of that story. Hell hath no fury like a woman against the establishment. Put that on a T-shirt, please, and uh, order one for everybody here. Okay, we will on with the next story. Um, our next storyteller is Carlos Gajiola. Carlos is Mexic is a Mexican immigrant coming from the state of Sinaloa. 
and being brought over to the United States uh, at the age of 10 months old, growing up with an American, oh wait, let me reread that, sorry. It's one of my host modes. Growing up with American customs as well as Mexican traditions, yes, I feel that. Uh, the phrase, ni de aquí, ni de allá, runs true for him. Carlos is currently a Sacramento State student and works at the Dreamer Resource Center here on campus. He is passionate about helping others with his same background and hopes that through telling his story, he can help others be proud of their immigrant status. Please join me in welcoming Carlos and Carlos's story, La Cadenita. I'm a little tall, guys. <laughs> so I got, should be good, yes. Yeah. All right, so picture this. It's my 13th birthday, and I'm at home celebrating with my family. I have my mom, my dad, my sisters. Everything's going great. I have the traditional tres leches pastel on this side and the gelatina de mosaico on this side. And I was just on top of the world. I had just turned 13. Everybody dreams of, you know, getting to that teenager stage um, as if I was going to move out of the house. I wasn't. I was, I was just turning 13. Um, but I was on top of the world, you know? And um, so having a great time. And suddenly my father exclaims. And he says, you know, I have a gift for you. And I love gifts. Who doesn't love gifts? And I was like, OK, perfect. He walks away. He comes back. And he comes back with this small royal blue box. And in my head, I'm like, well, if you were gonna give me $20, you could have just handed it to me. You, you didn't have to put it in a small royal blue box, you know? Um, yet before he hands it to me, he pauses, and he says that it's very sentimental, and it's a very important gift, and he needs to tell me the backstory. So he took us back in time, so now I'm gonna take you guys back in time. Um, so like mentioned before, I was born in the state of Sinaloa in Mexico, specifically Los Mochis, um, yes. And so, um, so yeah, my parents started their immigration journey when I was 10 months of age. So I have no memory of Mexico at all. I don't have any memory of like the little ranchito. I don't have any memory of family members there. Um, so I grew up with a disconnect from my Mexican family and my Mexican heritage at times. Um, you know, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents that had to stay. Not, not everyone was going to migrate, unfortunately. Um, so I grew up with that disconnect. Um, my parents would make phone calls almost daily if they could, if not every other day back home. Um, as I could imagine, you know, coming here, starting a whole new life, leaving your whole family, you want to maintain contact with them. And so I would see my parents talk to them, like I said, almost every day um, or every other day. And I would always wonder who was on the other side of the phone. And one day I recall, it was around when I was four or five when I was able to hold a conversation and be more fluent. Um, my parents started involving me in the phone calls. And at first it was literally, here, talk to your tia. Here, talk to your grandma. And as a child, that literally startles you. Like, who is on the other side of the phone? I thought I was going crazy. Like, I don't know this person. And so I'm startled and the conversations were always super awkward. It was like, hi, do you remember me? And I was like, <laughs> no, like, I, I, I don't know who you are, you know? Um, so it took a couple weeks and it, and it took even months for me to, you know, establish the fact that these are trustworthy individuals. This is my family. Um, so silly to think about. Um, but these are trustworthy individuals. So slowly but surely, I started building connections with many of them. Um, and the main one that I want to talk about today would be my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, or as I would call her, my nana. Me and my nana um, maintained contact during most of these phone calls. Um, you know, like I said at first, it was very much, you know, how was your day? How's school going? And then as I got a little older, we were able to bond um, during like hobbies and special interests. Um, so we bonded over our love of food. She would always say she would love to cook and I'd love to eat. So that, that was the connection. Um, but also we bonded over our love of telenovelas. And if you guys don't know, telenovelas are Mexican soap operas. So we would always tune into the current telenovela that was streaming 
And every phone call, we would literally recap last night's episode. And we would be like, can you believe the mother-in-law said that to the daughter-in-law? I can't believe he chose her. Did you see William Levy in Sortilegio? Like, it was, it was, you know, that was the basis of our main conversations. And we bonded over that. And it was something so special because I couldn't do that with any other family member. If I did that with a cousin or with an uncle, like, no, they, they weren't tuning in like my grandmother was. So that was the special bond we had with each other, as well as I had some family members that had work visas or travel permits and would come visit us in California. And before they would leave, she would call me and say, hurry up, what do you want me to sneak into their luggage? Like, it's gonna make your way to you. And I would always um, ask for tamarindo candies of any kind, as long as it was tamarindo, and empanadas de cajeta. I love empanadas de cajeta. Till this day, I request empanadas de cajeta. Like, if I find out someone's going and coming back, I need empanadas de cajeta. And lo and behold, a couple weeks later, empanadas de cajeta were in my kitchen. Um, so it was these little things of her that I had, you know, that she purposely sent to me. And in moments like that, it felt like the distance between us had gone away, and it felt like I was receiving a hug from her, in a sense, through these objects that she would send. So that kept going, obviously. Um, and to take you guys even more back in time, when my parents decided to immigrate to the US, um, the day of their start of the journey, my grandmother gave my dad, which is her son, um, a small gold chain. And she instructed him to keep this gold chain and gift it to me whenever he felt it was ready to do so. Um, and it was a gift from grandmother to grandson, and my dad was the keepsake of it. He couldn't tell anyone, you know, he just had to keep it safe and eventually was gonna make it into my hands. And I think in that moment she did it because she didn't know if she was gonna see her grandson ever again, let alone her actual son ever again. And I think it was her only moment to really send this piece of herself um, to my dad and to me. And so all these years went by, my dad kept it. Birthday after birthday, milestone after milestone, school year after school year. And during all these years, I kept contact with my grandmother, you know, happy sixth birthday, happy seventh birthday, um, another year of school done, keep studying, keep going, you know, and she wouldn't mention a thing. Obviously it was her secret as well. Um, and so my dad kept it all these years, all these years. So back to the story. Um, we're all sitting there and we're in complete shock. Uh, nobody knew he had it, like I said. I remember my mom actually being upset. Like my mom was like, why didn't you tell me you had that chain? Like, I shoulda known, I shoulda known. Um, but everyone else was just like, oh my God, like what do you mean? So lo and behold, he has me this small royal blue box and I open the box and there it is. Um, this small yellow gold cadenita, <laughs> this small yellow gold cadenita with, you know, silver embellishments, and just staring back at me, just glistening in the light. I, I was completely starstruck. And as soon as I opened it, I just got all these flashbacks. I got all these flashbacks of eating the empanadas of cajeta. I got all these flashbacks of recapping last night's episode with my grandmother, and something so small and fragile, but I felt like her entire presence was in the palm of my hands. I, I felt like I had her entire weight with me and as if she was there with me in person. Um, so I took it out of the small royal blue box, put it on, and afterwards I was like, where's the phone? I'm calling my grandma. And I wasn't calling to recap last night's episode. I was calling because of the cadenita. And I, she picks up and I was like, my dad finally gave me the cadenita. Like, I remember just being super, super thankful. I kept saying thank you. I kept saying, you know, gracias, gracias. I love it, me encanta, me encanta. And she started crying herself, you know. I, I think she was waiting for this moment for years now, obviously. 13 years, she was like, finally, like, you know. She was like, oh. she was like, I've been waiting for this day, like your dad, you know, and I'm like, my dad. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it was just this super special moment that we were able to bond. And once again, I felt like all that distance was went away. I felt like she was right in front of me. And as much as I would have wanted her to literally be there on my 13th birthday, it just wasn't possible. And the cadenita was there for her. So 
afterwards, we obviously kept going with our phone calls and phone call after phone call, I would always bring it up. I would always be like, I can't believe it. Like, thank you so much. Me encanta. Muchísimas gracias. You know, and she thought it became a little repetitive. She's like, you're welcome. Like, you you have it. Like, <laughs> don't, like don't stop reminding me, you know. Um, but we were just both so super, super happy. And it really just made our bond so much stronger. You know, something that went directly or that came directly from her and you know it was touched by her purchased by her and and you know it was set over by her so it was just a super super special bond that it just made our connection so much stronger um and sadly uh two months after my birthday that same year my grandmother passes away you know um she leaves us and, you know, um, as much as I would have wanted to have the Caranita way before two months, you know, to, to have that special bond with her, I really do think it was all in just divine timing. And I'm so glad it happened before she, you know, left this world. Um, ooh, I kind of blinked out. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's just like this super special bond that I was able to have. And, and those two months worth of phone calls is something that till this day, I still have flashbacks of. I still, you know, hold dearly. If I had the recordings of them, oh my God, I wish. Um, you know, but it's just a moment in time in my life that I just really hold dearly. Um, so as you guys can imagine, I very much do cherish this cadenita, this small gold chain. Um, I make sure to wear it whenever I have an achievement, whenever I have a milestone, special event. Um, every year after, or every year after that, I make sure I have it on my birthday, whether I wear it or it's on me, I have to make sure I have it. Um, I remember I wore it when I graduated high school. She was very big on my education. I wore it when I toured Sac State for my orientation, my first day at Sac State. Um, I wore it my first day at the Juma Resource Center. My, my DRC team, my dream team. Um, and it's just all those little things that I wish she was really here to, to witness herself, you know what I mean? Um, and I'm wearing, I'm, I feel like I'm wearing her right now, you know what I mean? I feel like she's looking at me in the audience. She's, she's here with me, I really do feel that. Um, I also wear it if I ever need a push or a motivation as to why I'm here, why I'm doing what I'm doing, why my parents made that sacrifice. Um, every time I wear it during one of those days, I feel like, a weight on my chest, but it's not negative. It's it's comforting. It's it's something that I need throughout those days. Um, and I like to tell people that I imagine her like in the cartoons, like I feel like she's on my shoulder and she's like whispering, like, Echale ganas, like, tu puedes, like, estoy orgullosa de ti. Like those little catchphrases or those motivations that she would tell me during those phone calls, I feel like I hear them throughout the day. I'm not crazy, I promise. Oh my God. <laughs> um, you know, and it's just something that I cherish deeply, deeply so much. And um, yeah, so I think that this cadenita is like the object version of the journey that my parents took when they had me as a little baby. Um, it immigrated with us. I like to think of it like that. It, you know, traveled all that distance, whether it was in my dad's pocket or his bag, I don't even know. But it went through all those miles, the weather with my parents. Like, it's it's true resilience shows and it's like the objectification of my immigrant journey. Um, I also like to think of it as ourselves, as the immigrant community. Um, you know, it's a chain, so it's made up of interlocking pieces and it creates this beautiful piece of jewelry that shines. And we immigrants right now, we're coming together, we're interlocked, we're coming together to, you know, shine, to shine like this gold little chain, to make ourselves visible, to make ourselves shown to the world. And it's something so, so special. And I feel such a sense of community being here. Um, I'll close off by saying, you know, we are, the embodiment of resilience, of perseverance, and I stand as a personification of the American dream that my parents had and that I have and that maybe even my grandmother had for herself one day. Um, but wherever I go in life, this cadenita will continue traveling with me and it'll continue making its own dreams come true with me.
Thank you, Carlos. Round of applause for the jewelry of it all. Uh, the Cadenita story also reminds me of, there was a, a woman in our neighborhood when I was growing up who my mom used to call La Joyera, and she would come to our house with these like bags full of uh, black velvet and unwrap it, and it would be all sorts of gold, and I thought she stole it until I realized that it was her job to sell jewelry to people. Um, so yes, jewelry is very special. Uh, and I appreciate that story and uh, what it all represents. And I now want to say we are going to have a intermission. We will be back in this room at 725. So please take your few moments to head, go outside, connect with a new person, share some things about stories, use the restroom, get some water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we will be back here at 725. So before, before I jump on into the next story, I thought, what little micro story can I share just to give you all uh, another vignette of my uh, immigrant bicultural experience? Um, so the other one that I will share is uh, about manure. So raise your hand if you sm find the felt smell of manure comforting. <laughs> all right, y'all are my people. <laughs> I find the smell of manure comforting the backstory for why that is, is because as a kid, my dad had an old red Chevy van that had beige carpet inside. Uh, and we used it as our everyday van, but my dad was also a handyman and a landscaper part-time on weekends when he wasn't a carpenter during the week, which meant that sometimes he would use the van to haul the manure to the houses of the people that he was in charge of caring for their gardens. And every summer, that is the van we would drive 12 hours to El Paso in for our family vacation. It did not have air conditioning. All of us crammed into it together, crowded with luggage, sweat, and the smell of manure to keep us all comfortable while we drove the eternity to make it to El Paso, leave our truck there, and then take a bus into Mexico to visit our grandma and family members. Because you don't drive into Mexico, if they see American plates, they're pulling you over and asking you for money. <laughs> uh, so unfortunate, but also, you know, it happens. So that uh, smell of manure reminds me of sibling unity and rivalry. It reminds me of beige carpet. And it reminds me about the smell of hard work. So I leave that all with you as a, another way to think of manure. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we move on to our next storyteller here. Ooh, where's my, there we go. All right, our next storyteller, who you may have uh, had a chance to interact with outside at her jewelry table, uh, please make sure you check it out after the show if you did not. Uh, Janini Mapurunga uh, is a native of Brazil who felt confined by a culture where machismo and violence against women are prevalent. At the age of 16, she left everything she knew and came to California alone in search of a place where she could spread her wings. Her undergrad work is in photography and cultural anthropology, and for grad school, she focused on visual culture, artistic production, and research. She got her first camera at the age of 10, a Christmas gift from her grandmother. At that first roll of film, she knew there was no going back and has been photog photographing, photographing, my goodness, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> this is just a public speaking moment for Grace. I appreciate the Grace lets all laugh at me. <laughs> photographing, not photo photographing, ever since. As a documentary photographer and filmmaker, she helps people tell their stories through her work as a visual storyteller. With the help of capital storytelling, Janini began sharing her own stories. Going from behind the camera to the spotlight is a scary thing for her, but she decided to do it because she believes in the power of oral storytelling as a tool for collective healing, understanding, and compassion. Please join me in welcoming Janini and Janini's story, My First Camera. Good evening, everyone. 
A round of applause for everybody who is volunteering and working with Capital Storytelling. This is a beautiful organization. Thank you. Thank you, guys. When I was 10 years old, my grandma asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And knowing that she didn't have much money, I said, don't worry about it, Grandma. I don't need anything. But she insisted. She said, what do you really want? And I said, well, what I really want is a camera. And so she asked my mother to take me to the camera store to pick out a camera. And at the camera store, I asked the salesman, which one is your cheapest camera? And he, he handed me this camera right here. It's a plastic point and shoot with a plastic lens. And my grandma bought this camera and a roll of film, which she paid for in five monthly installments. So it was Christmas, the family was at my grandma's house, and there I was with my new camera. And I knew that this was a precious resource and I didn't want to be wasteful. So I thought intentionally about what to photograph for my first roll of film. And I asked myself, what is the most important thing to me? And the answer was obvious. The most important thing to me was my dog. <laughs> my dog had long, soft hair, and he was all white, except for his ears and his nose, which were black, and that made him look like a little panda dog. <laughs> and so I took my dog in my grandma's garden, and I put him next to the rose bush, and I made a picture, and I made a picture. I put him on the bench, and I made a picture. I put him next to the fern, and I made a picture. And in that way, I shot the whole roll of film. It was all portraits of my dog. <laughs> And when I got to the end of the film, I got super excited and I ran back in the house and I started jumping around. I just shot my first roll of film. I just shot my first roll of film. And in the living room, my relatives were there watching TV. There were adults, there were kids, and nobody paid attention to me. They just kept watching TV, except for my uncle who turned toward me and he said, what's that? And I said, it's a camera. And he said, let me see it. So I handed him the camera, and he said, how do you open it? And I pointed to the button, which he immediately pressed, and he opened the back of the camera, and he pulled out the whole roll of film, ruining all of my work. And he handed it back to me, the camera and the film, and he said, this is not a child's toy. And then he turned back and uh, went back to the TV. About a year later, when I was 11 years old, my mother showed up to work one morning and she was laughing really hard. And she was telling her coworkers, you would not believe what my daughter said last night. She said, she's gonna leave the country. Where do kids get these ideas? I understand why my mother was in such disbelief at my idea of leaving the country when I was 11 years old. She was a single mom, she didn't have much money, and I had never traveled, so yeah, where did I get that idea? In order to understand the mind space of the 11-year-old me, I have to take you all the way back to the beginning. When my mother got pregnant with me, my father, he put it in his mind that he was not the father of that baby. And he was already known for having very violent behaviors 
And that belief made him act even more violent towards my mother. Sometimes my mother had visible bruises when she went to work. And when I was born, my mother had a lot on her plate. She was dealing with my father. She already had my brother who was five years old and she got really sick and she just couldn't take care of me. So I went to live with my grandma in a small town up in the hills where our family was from and my mother stayed in the big city. And when I was four years old, it was time for me to go to school. And my mother thought that the schools in the city would provide a better education. And so she took me back and that's how I went to live with my mom. And at the time, she was divorced. She was living in a rented apartment and my brother was nine years old. And my brother, he was not happy with this arrangement because he was used to being the prince of the household and now there was this new child. And so he became very mean to me. He would say things like that his mother found me in a garbage can and that I was not her daughter. And the proof of that was the fact that she was blonde and he was blonde, but I was dark. So there's no way that I could be her daughter. Unfortunately, my brother was not the only person who bullied me. I was bullied in school, at home, in sports, and I just didn't feel like there was a safe place for me to be. So I started to escape to this fantasy world in my mind. And I started to fantasize about having an invisible cape because if nobody could see me, then nobody could hurt me. And I also started to fantasize about being a boy because boys and men were free. They could do whatever they wanted with no consequence. My brother could go play with his friends anytime he wanted and I had to stay home and do chores like cooking and cleaning. And no matter how detailed I followed the directions of how to do the chores, it was never good enough. I didn't sweep well enough. I didn't hang the clothes on the line the right way. I didn't mash the potatoes well enough. It was like boys could do no wrong, but I could do no right. I would study really hard for a test, and if I got a 90%, I was questioned and reprimanded. Why isn't it 100%? But my brother got bad grades all the time and nothing happened. Just needed to take a breath. So when school would get out, I would go back to my grandma's house in the small town up in the hills. And my grandma's house was a very interesting place. There was sewing and crochet and painting and ceramics and parrots and chickens and these really intricate recipes. And my grandma was an entrepreneur she started to support her family with cooking and eventually she turned her family home into a hotel. And as a child, I was very curious about these guests that came from these faraway places to stay with us. And I loved to talk to them and ask them all these questions about where they came from. When I was 13 years old, I started to work after school, tutoring the kids who were younger than me because I wanted to save money to become an exchange student. And by the time I was 15, my mother started to take me seriously. And so she decided to help me gather the necessary resources um, in order for me to be able to study abroad. 
I fantasized about being in a place where I could spread my wings really wide and I could fly as high as I wanted to without being weighed down by the fact that I was a girl. So I needed a passport and my mother took me to the passport office where they told us that in order for me to get a passport, they needed my father's signature on the document. And my, my mother got pretty upset about this because my father had chosen not to be in the picture and, um, and she was fully responsible, but he still had a lot of control and that's how the laws are in Brazil. They favor the men a lot. So I called my father and I asked him if he would sign the document. He yelled a bunch of obscenities on the phone and he accused my mother of wanting to prostitute me in another country. And he said that if it was up to him, I would never get a passport. Some time passed and my father, he was an entrepreneur. Uh, he, he was a business owner. And so I thought, well, maybe he'll give me a job. So I called him and he said, yeah, he would hire me. So I started working at his office and my job was to do data entry and paperwork. And one day I was asked to take some documents for his office for him to sign and I that evening. <laughs> you know where this is going, audience. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I needed that energy. <laughs> I'm on the hot seat up here. And so that evening, I went home with one of those documents. And the next morning, I called, and I quit my job, and I started to practice how to write my father's signature. <laughs> so I wrote my father's signature in the passport document, and that's how I got my passport. <laughs> it's really not easy to talk about this stuff, you guys. So when I was 16 years old, um, I arrived in California as an exchange student where I enrolled in high school as a senior at a place called Elk Grove. <laughs> Some of you might know where that is. <laughs> and I got super excited because I found out that they had photography classes at this high school. And in Brazil, they didn't teach art in school. So I went to the office to sign up for photography class, but they told me that the class was full. They said, there is no room for even photography class. So I went to talk to the photography teacher and I begged him and I said, please, 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 will you please find me a spot in your photography class. And he said, I'm sorry, the class is full. There is no room for you in photography class. But then he offered me a deal. He said that if I stayed after school and helped him clean the dark room, he would teach me photography. And that's how I got my first photography lessons. Now we fast forward to today I'm 43 years old. I've been photographing ever since that first roll of film when I was 10. And I've been a professional photographer my entire adult life. And thinking back at my trajectory, I think about my grandma. She was a very creative person. Um, she loved to be surrounded by beauty. She had a very keen sense of aesthetics. And up until she died a year ago at 92 years old, every day she would make beautiful flower arrangements from the flowers in her garden. And it was inspired by my grandma that I chose art as a profession. 
It's really hard work being a working artist, but it was inspired by her that I chose this career path. And then I think about my high school photography teacher, this man from another country who met me one time, a teenage girl from a faraway land with a thick accent. And he decided to invest in me. And I recently reconnected with my high school photography teacher. He just retired from a career teaching high school. And I invited him to my studio downtown and I asked him, why did you do that? Why did you make more work for yourself to stay after school and teach me? You didn't have to do that. And he said that he saw real potential in me. The thing is, is we're not confined to the environment in which we're born. We're not restricted to the circumstances in which we grow up. We can create our own path. And along the way, we will meet people who will clip our wings to try and keep us from flying. But we will also meet people who will help us to realize that we can actually go pretty far. And it's people like my grandma and my high school photography teacher. And I dedicate this story to them and to all the people like them who help people like me to fly. Now my grandma's here with us in spirit, but my high school photography teacher is here with us in his physical presence. And I would like to invite the audience to put your hands together and honor this man. Mr. Franklin, will you please stand up and receive all of this y'all. From the bottom of my heart, Mr. Franklin, thank you. One more round of applause. Thank you all. All right, our next storyteller is, uh, well, one thing, I wanna just also give a beautiful shout out to the power of arts, to the power of educators, and to the power of shared stories and ancestry. Amazing. Uh, our next storyteller is Nancy Awad. Uh, Nancy is a native Arabic speaker from Egypt and emigrated to the U.S. eight years ago. She's a mom, a daughter, an employee, and a student. Nancy is currently working towards her degree in social work, which she expects to receive from Sacramento State in 2025. <laughs> Snaps for the social workers, yes. For the past three years, she has been working with refugees in a nonprofit organization. She is fascinated by the world of social work and loves connecting with people. She finds this work deeply fulfilling. This will be her first time sharing a story on stage. She is excited for this experience. Outside of parenting and work, she loves biking, reading, and public speaking. I love it too. Yes. So please join me in welcoming Nancy, uh, one um, note for Nancy is that Nancy's story does contain some mentions of violence, so just uh, care for yourselves uh, as we listen together to Nancy's story, what we choose and what we don't. different from here. You're a little bit scary. <laughs> I promise you, you're about to leave. 
Okay, um, I was born and raised in Egypt. Then I moved to United States to the United States in 2016. So as uh, Diana mentioned, like less than nine years ago. Um, and today I'm going to share with you about my journey from Egypt to the United States and all the choices that I had made and the choices that were made for me by the circumstances. Um, leaving Egypt was never a choice I'd love to take or made. Even when one of my family members uh, was persecuted because of our Christian faith back to 2008. And that uh, impacted me negatively and put me in a, a potential dangerous situation. When we had this opportunity to leave or to move out of Egypt to the United States, I refused the idea. Not to the fact that I hate the United States and not because of my feeling um, of home in Egypt, but because I had a vision for my entire future. I had a vision of my career, and I had a vision of the community I want to live. I had a vision about the population I want to serve, and I had a vision for my relationships and the, even the place I want to live at. And I lived, I, I loved Egypt to the core of my heart, and all my feeling was about Egypt was it's not just a place I lived in, but Egypt lived in me. And three years after, in 2011, and I was pregnant with my first daughter, Sophia, and that's when the revolution began in Egypt and everything started falling apart. The streets were feeling of chaos, daily protests around the country, crazy clashes between civilians and military that got so crazy, and so many people were killed at that time. And whoever were able uh, to leave the country just left, but not me. I was still there hanging on to this vision and thinking that everything would be better. And I'm gonna be part of this changing that's what happened in my country. Two years after, um, which was 2013, the Brotherhood took over uh, the government. And for those who don't know who are the Brotherhoods, they are very strict, aggressive Islamic group of people that were banned in Egypt for years and years. And when they took over, things started getting really worse in Egypt, particularly for Christians uh, who were persecuted. And so many, so many churches were burned. And so many people like left, like left Egypt during that time. But not me, I was still hanging on. Like I'm holding on this vision and I wanna live in the place where I called home. And that was until September, 2013, when I was visiting my mom that day with Sophia, who was um, about to turn two years old. And we were laughing, we were talking, we were having a delicious Egyptian food, and we were getting ready to um, go attending my cousin's wedding. And that day, my dad had parked his car um, in front of a store that um, had, not, um, had not yet opened for the day. And when the, the store owner came, he didn't like my dad's car parked in front of his store, and he got mad. And he stormed to my mom's house and started yelling at my dad and involved in a, a verbal fight with him. And before I even knew it, my brother got involved and they all started a physical uh, fight. Few minutes after, the, the store owner's brother got also involved and this last guy came with a, um, a glass uh, a glass picture, a, a glass picture frame, as like probably he found it on his way and just grab it as a potential weapon to offend himself, to defend himself and his brother. And I was close, like close the fight. When this guy decided to use this frame, and the frame broke into too many pieces. And at that time, I felt like whoops, things getting crazy, I will not catch up on that. And I just stepped away to take care of Sophia, who was standing few steps away, watching and crying and screaming. And when I, when I reached down to pick up Sophia, I just 
saw the blood everywhere on the stairs. And I was shocked to see that big hole in my arm. And I was pretty sure I lost a piece of my arm. And it just looked at the stairs looking for the missing piece. And I, I, get, I got panicked and I started screaming. They were all still fighting and no one paid attention to my screams. Then once my brother like, saw me get hurt, he stopped fighting and he rushed me to get help. We went to uh, a pharmacy. That's where all Egyptians go first. We treat ourselves. We are not going to doctors. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that was our first stop. And they, the guy there said like, no, 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 no. That's a serious injury. You need to go to a hospital. And we were walking and panicking. So we went to like a, a, a closest place, like urgent care. That's that where, that, I'm sorry, that was uh, closer than a hospital. And they just poorly cleaned it up and wrapped it. And they said, you need to go to a hospital. That's a serious injury. <laughs> and it took me six hours plus to go to a two hospitals. And the first one rejected us. And the second one had so long process before they allow me to be seen. And during that waiting time, I remember like I started feeling the pain in my left, in my left arm. You know, when it's a fresh injury, usually you are not feeling that. So I started feeling the pain and I was panicking because I didn't feel my hand from here to the top of my fingers and I didn't feel my fingers. And my middle finger was falling forward in a very weird and un unnatural way. And at the, these moments I was thinking, I am probably gonna lose my fingers or at least my hands function. And I was doing something really dumb. I was supporting my, my, my left finger with my right hand like that, trying to thinking like, at least if I'm going to lose my hands function, it would look good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was terrifying. <laughs> so, I'm glad you're laughing because like, oh my God, that's a very painful moment. <laughs> and, uh, like, uh, finally, after like six plus hours, I was seen by a doctor and I was taken to the operation room to have the surgery in my, 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 my arm and they put it in a cast. Uh, you probably wonder now, did I kill the guy or come back? Because like, I have to revenge now. I didn't do that. But I tried to sue the guy. Uh, and in my journey that has so many details between police stations and courts, I realized the very import important realization that I would get nothing at the end. And I will just waste time and waste money and waste energies that I already didn't have at that time. And I will not take anything. Like who would care about like an individual incident that like might happen every day or maybe worse than it? People losing their lives. So who would care? during that time, so I just give up. And here I was, just had a surgery, my arm was in a cast, wasn't able to take care of myself or taking care of Sophia. And all these situations and going back and forth between police stations and courts and hospital and physical therapy that I was expecting after a month, and I wouldn't even know if the physical therapy will get my arms function again or not. And all that left me with very heavy feeling of um, disrespected, feeling disrespected and unvalid in the place I, I felt home and unsafe. And, that w and I had a one question, only one question during that time, what would happen if that were to happen to Sophia and I wasn't able to protect her or get her right back telling her, sorry, we have a law, but we are not practicing that. And with a very heavy heart, 
that was the first moment I was thinking about leaving Egypt. My uh, husband at that time um, had the visa already to the United States, and I tried to apply, but they denied me. It's not easy to get your visa, guys. Yeah, but I got it finally. <laughs> so we decided that he's going to leave to the United States, and I'm going to stay, uh, Sophia and I going to stay um, in Egypt until he would be able to um, claim an asylum case. So, uh, the next two years, I, Sophia and I stayed at my parents' house with so many fears and worries about future and about the decision I chose or I made or was made for me. And so many disappointments for the fact that I will not be able to live in the place I considered home and giving away all my visions and plans for future in this land. Two years after, the visa came. Yay! <laughs> I wasn't excited. That wasn't a moment for me. I knew that it was coming, but I never was excited for it. And I remember I was trying to delay the process as much as possible just to gain some money with my family and with my friends. And I remember this very difficult moments at the airport when I was sobbing, saying the last goodbye for everyone, saying goodbye to my parents, knowing that I'm leaving a lot behind, knowing that I, I'm leaving my heart in Egypt and I'm leaving a part of myself, knowing that I'm gonna lose a lot, and I know that. Then in 2016, I arrived to the land of dreams, to America and nothing was exciting for me. Um, I wasn't speak English enough, maybe like now, <laughs> to communicate enough with people, which is very, very, very important to a very social person like me. Um, I wasn't driving. I definitely didn't work at that time. I didn't have any community around me, nothing. And the only thing that I would or could do like taking Sophia and walk to the park just to let the time pass. Um, however, and despite all of that, and despite all the feeling of empty and lonely and disappointment, I had this optimistic heart that was beeping, beating in my, in my chest. And I started or decided to think differently and feel, let's come up with a different plan different vision in the new land. And here I am in 2017, a year after um, I get here, and that's the fun part. I, uh, I went to Sierra College to uh, start my education path, and it was really, really very challenging to navigate the education system and to know everything that's completely different than Egypt. Like, guys, we are writing from right to left. You are writing from left to right. I don't understand that. Like, I don't understand, like, literally, I didn't create it to, to be, like, an English writer, whatever. So, I really had a challenging time. However, uh, I was blessed, like, to have so many people supported me. Uh, one of them was my counselor, like, a, a great counselor there. I hope, like, she was going to be here today, but she couldn't. And she helped me a lot to navigate things and found like the, um, like the communication or the social skills in me. But by the way, like I have one of my ESL professor here, Professor Jessica, thanks for coming. I appreciate you. Thanks a lot. And Professor Jessica was one of the most amazing ESL, ESL classes. Like she made it really easy and nice and smooth. Like I got A in her class. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Professor. Yeah. So, um, and uh, this amazing counselor just introduced me to the, the, the world of social work. And I finished um, my English classes, my, gen my general education in uh, Sierra College, and I transferred to Sac State. And I am expecting to graduate in spring 2025 with a degree of social work. <laughs> I would say I am considered myself successful. I'm way, I'm, I'm more happier. Um, 
the the second semester uh, of C, uh, of Sac State, and before I start the third semester, I also got a job in one of the most amazing nonprofit organization. It's called World Relief, where uh, I am working with as a caseworker with a refugee. Uh, from a population that's similar to the one that I came from, and I have been serving them and working with this organization for three years now as a caseworker. Um, you can reach me after that if you want to be volunteer with us. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so like I had so many moments of uh, success and like fields and. So many times, like hiccups here and there, and sudden, like um, sudden, like sadness, emotions, like knowing that probably I would not have the same level that I had in in Egypt, educationally and socially, like even enough that you are not speaking your mother tongue, um, like your your own language. It's really struggle, but I choose every day to have a life here, to create a new opportunities and new communities for myself and for my two daughters. I got another one in 2017. Hi, pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I wanna um, finish my story and leave you guys with two things I have learned in this journey. The first thing that I have learned that why we cannot change the circumstances around us the decisions that we made or the choices that we made or were made for us, we can still change our view to these circumstances. And from that shift, we can create so many opportunities or accept so many opportunities around us and create a new life. And the second thing that I have learned from my personal journey and from working with so many refugees that each immigrant that like carries, carries the very heavy burden in their hearts. So many stories and so many memories and so much left behind. And not always uh, for better, better life, by the way, or by choice. And that understanding deepened my perspective and reminding me to um, approach people or approach other with the empathy that they truly deserve. Thank you and have a good night, everybody. One more round of applause. Edith. So much inspiration. Uh, while Kim uh, pull, pulls up what uh, we need to pull up, I'm going to give you all a few announcements. Um, so a couple things. One more big round of applause and thank you to Cap Radio for supporting their evening. To SMUD for supporting their evening. Um, also just want to share with you all that if you are interested in uh, any way to get involved or connected to Capital Storytelling, we have a live show called Do Tell that happens uh, monthly. We offer classes. You can also hire us if you want to bring storytelling to your organizations. So just ask us out at the desk uh, and we are happy to provide you with any of that information or email us at info at capitalstorytelling.com and uh, we can connect you to all those great things. Uh, are you ready? Kim, for the projection? Okay, so we're gonna do a quick projection just to give you one last uh, announcement. Hello, everyone. There was going to be a projection, but my, my laptop died. And <laughs> but the extension cord's like all the way back there. And so and I know a lot of things going on today with me, but you all have the little flyers. I hope, and uh, just my last reminder was to please, please consider donating to the Dreamer Resource Center. All of your donations, 100% of your donations will be going towards undocumented students. We buy school supplies, Scantrons, Blue Books. We also uh, provide emergency grants for students, and we're able to provide more resources when we fundraise. So I really hope you'll consider um, sending some money over to, <laughs> to us. Um, and I appreciate you all so much for being here. On behalf of Sacramento State and the Dreamer Resource Center, we appreciate you being here, and we appreciate you celebrating National Immigrants Day.
Thank you. And thank you for the backstory about beat extension cords and such. Uh, one last thing I will say is uh, I just want to give you all a round of applause for being here and being in community with us this evening. Storytelling is really, really a powerful way to connect with one another. Um, and also each of our storytellers worked very hard on preparing these stories and we appreciate you coming to witness them. Um, that is half of what the magic of storytelling is, is having listeners. So I appreciate every single pair of ears that is in this room tonight. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, please take a look at the tables on the way out. Uh, Dreamer Resource Center has information out there. Uh, Janini has her uh, jewelry out there. So, and and uh, they're very colorful and amazing. So take a look at that and also information from Capital Storytelling. Um, and I just wanna do one more uh, can I get all of our storytellers to come up to just do one bow all together so we can give them a big round of applause? Join us, friends. We've been preparing since April. Wonderful, wonderful job, everybody. Uh, I want to just, uh, once again, while you all are coming up, acknowledge the public speaking feat it is to be human in public on a microphone in front of others. So thank you all for the support, the grace, everything. One big bow and round of applause. Yes, thank you all. And with that, please drive home safely. And also, uh, if you can and are interested for our social media, Lucy, please wave Lucy. If you're interested in finding Lucy outside um, and sharing a short little video about your experience being in community with us and being an audience member this evening, Lucy is creating some content for Capital Storytelling's social media and we'd love to get some on the spot testimonials. So please find Lucy outside if you're interested in doing that. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Please drive safely uh, and we appreciate you. Good night.